fuels and heats of reaction. A hydrocarbon is a compound that only contains carbon and hydrogen. There are three classes or families of hydrocarbons, alkanes, alkenes and alkynes, and they all differ due to their bonding. You must know these three in some detail. The alkanes only have single bonds between carbon atoms, therefore we class them as saturated compounds. The endings must contain A and E. You do need to know the names and structures of the first 10 alkanes. It looks more complicated than it actually is. You will be using the alkanes so much that it will be easy to remember. Plus, if you look at pentane onwards, you'll notice that the name is the exact same as the shapes you learnt in maths. The golden rule is that carbon always has four bonds. So once you know the amount of carbons, the hydrogens are easy to place. You need to know to slide off by heart. Try to understand it. You can get full marks for getting some of this definition correct. The International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC, is responsible for rules for naming organic molecules. We've seen the first 10 alkanes already. These simply have to be learnt off. You will need to know them in order to name different compounds. Alkyl groups are basically side chain substituents. There are three alkyl groups, methyl, ethyl and propyl, very similar to the naming of the first three alkanes. Met, et, and pro. You need to learn these alkyl groups off. Methyl groups are far more common of the three, but ethyl and propyl do appear now and then. Let's look at an example. You are asked to name this compound. We must follow the nomenclature rules. Step 1. Number the longest continuous chain of carbons, while ensuring the alkyl groups get the lowest number possible. If we count from left to right, the methyl groups would be numbered 2 and 3. Or, if you count from right to left, the methyl groups would be 3 and 4. Therefore, we count left to right. Step 2. Once we have the longest continuous chain, we now have the name for the end of the compound. In this case, it is pentane. Step 3. We must label the position of the two methyl groups, which are on the carbon 2 and carbon 3. We include the di because there are two of the same alkyl group. Note, it is extremely important when attaching any methyl or ethyl groups. You make it obvious that it is the carbon to carbon bonding occurring. Very often students have the bonds between carbon and hydrogen. You might not get the marks if this is the case. Next question. You could be given the molecular structure and be asked to name it, or you could be given the name of the molecule and be asked to draw it. For example, 224 trimethyl pentane. Step 1. Draw out the longest continuous chain. In this case, it is pentane. Step 2. Number the carbons. It doesn't matter this time which side you count from, as you are already given the position of the methyl groups. Step 3. There are three methyl groups due to the word trimethyl being used. We also know the position of these three methyl groups. Carbon 2 takes two CH3 groups, whereas carbon 4 gets one methyl group. Step 4. Write in the hydrogens for all the other bonds, and double check that each carbon atom has four bonds. So far we have seen straight chain alkane compounds, but you can also get them in a ring shaped structure. For instance, cyclohexane here is cyclo because it is ring shaped, and hexane because there are six carbon atoms. Each carbon atom has four bonds. Because this way is kind of tiresome to draw, Chemists use a second, more common way of drawing cyclo-shaped molecules. Each point represents a carbon atom. We do not need to do, we do not have to draw in the hydrogen atoms.
Isomer compounds of the same molecular formula, but their structural formulas differ. You must be able to find isomers from a named compound. Isomers require practice to figure out, and you may have to do several attempts before you can find the correct answer. The golden rule is to ensure that carbon always has four bonds and hydrogen just the one. The biggest mistake students make is that they do not count the longest continuous chain of carbons. If the end carbon is angled differently, this does not mean it is an isomer. It actually probably isn't. Alkenes are similar to alkanes, except they have a carbon-carbon double bond present. The majority of alkenes only have one double bond present. However, cyclic structures can have more. We would class alkanes as unsaturated, due to them having a carbon-carbon double bond. The naming of alkenes follows the same structure as alkanes, for instance, etene, propene, butene, and so forth. The difference is that the endings all end in ene. We start naming alkenes with etene, as a single carbon alkene cannot exist. Alkenes have a double bond, but note how each carbon atom still has four bonds. Etene is one of the most important organic chemicals. It is used commercially for many things, such as solvents, and also helps to ripen fruits, such as bananas. Bananas are picked from trees still green. Etene is a gas that is applied during the boat journey so that they will be ripe when they are on the shelves in shops. This is why bags around bananas have tiny holes in them to allow etene gas in and out. Alkene properties are much the same as alkanes. They are more reactive, however, due to the high electron density among the double bonds. Similar to alkanes, their boiling points increase with size due to van der Waals forces. Naming alkenes is very much the same procedure as naming alkanes. However, you now need to include the double bond. Step 1. Number the carbon atoms. The double bond is always the lowest number, even if there are methyl groups attached. Step 2. Write down the beginning of the name of the longest continuous chain. In this case, it is but. Step 3. Now include the location of the double bond. The double bond is on the carbon 1. So therefore it is called but1ene. Note, you may see in other examples that if the double bond is on the first carbon atom, then sometimes people just ignore the one and it may be called butene instead. This only applies for alkenes with the double bond on the first carbon atom. You could also be asked to find isomers of alkenes, which can be a little trickier, but they still follow the same rules. For but1ene, there are two isomers. Double check the molecular formulas to ensure they are all the same. In the chemical bonding lesson, I spoke about planar and non planar com compounds. You could be asked in the exam to identify planar and non planar atoms. Anything with a double or triple bond is always considered to be planar overall as a molecule. Some carbon atoms may be tetrahedral within the molecule, but overall it is classed as planar. Similar to alkanes, you can also get alkenes in a ring shape. Example, cyclohexene. There is one other cycloalkene called benzene that you need to be familiar with. I will discuss this molecule soon. Alkynes are also unsaturated due to the presence of a triple bond. There is only one alkyne you need to know, and that is etine. Etine is used in welding and cutting. You need to know the difference between alpheatic and aromatic compounds. This distinction is very clear. Any compound that consists of open or closed chain compounds are alpheatic, whereas any compound that contains a benzene ring is aromatic. We will now look at benzene in some more detail. This is a very important slide that you must learn off.
Crude oil is fossil fuel that is extracted from the ground by a process known as fracking. The oil is obtained has not yet been treated. It is sludgy and cannot be used as a fuel. Fractional distillation is something you need to learn off. You do need to know the examples and their uses. In terms of understanding, it is the smaller compounds that are near the top, due to them having lower boiling points than the heavier molecules down the bottom. Smaller molecules have weaker van der Waal bonding. Note, LPG stands for liquid petroleum gas. The octane number, a very important part to this chapter. Pre-ignition, also known as auto-ignition, occurs when the incorrect petrol-to-air mixture is ignited. This causes a loud metallic noise in the car, which we call knocking, followed by the loss of power. Knocking can damage cars' engines, so engineers and chemists must find a way to prevent this from occurring. The octane number has a range from 0 to 100. The higher the octane number, the more efficient the fuel. There are two reference hydrocarbons, heptane and 224-trimethylpentane. Why is one fuel better than the other? Well, short chains, lots of branching, which are methyl-nethyl groups, and cyclic structures cause higher octane numbers. Chemists often have to process fuel to increase its efficiency. In the past, a lead compound, tetraethyl lead, was added to increase the octane number. However, since 2000, Ireland has stopped adding lead to petrol due to it being toxic to humans and also poisoning catalytic converters. This is why in gas stations, petrol is marked as unleaded. Chemists know of four methods to increase the octane number. Isomerization, catalytic cracking, dehydrosylization, and adding oxidatives. We will go through each of these in some detail. Catalytic cracking involves the breaking down of long hydrocarbon chains into shorter carbon chains by means of a catalyst. This reaction always produces one alkene. When doing a question on catalytic cracking, you will need to make sure that there is no loss of carbons or hydrogens. Dehydrosylization is the changing of straight-chained hydrocarbons into ring-shaped compounds. By doing so, hydrogen gas, H2, is always removed, hence the name dehydro. Adding oxidatives such as methanol, ethanol, MTBE, increased octane number and have the added advantage of producing less pollution. Hydrogen is the only other fuel that you need to know about. It is quite a clean fuel and it is very efficient. Steam reforming of methane with a catalyst manufactures hydrogen gas on a large scale. Breaking down methane is good because methane contributes to global warming. However, the byproduct, carbon monoxide, is dangerous. Electrolysis of water is another method of producing hydrogen gas. However, this method is very expensive. Note, it is important when describing the product you say hydrogen gas and not hydrogen. It is a molecule we are forming, not the element. Hydrogen gas is easy to transport because of its low molecular mass and it also has a very high octane number. However, it is often too explosive to use as a fuel. Thermochemistry is the maths part of this chapter. Thermochemistry is essentially down to two reactions that involve heat change. Exothermic is the release of heat whereas endothermic is the taking in of heat. 
i.e. the surroundings get cooler. Delta H is the symbol we will use to indicate if there is a heat change in a chemical reaction. If the delta H is negative, it is exothermic, it releases heat. The surroundings get warmer. Whereas if the delta H is positive, it is endothermic, it takes in heat. The surroundings get cooler. For example, the production of water is exothermic and has a delta H value of minus 242 kilojoules per mole. You are not expected to learn off any delta H value. However, later on, you will be doing some calculations that will help you to determine the delta H value. If we double the amount of moles, then we double the heat of reaction too. A bomb calorimeter is a device used to measure the heat of combustion. You do not need to be able to label a bomb calorimeter, just need to know its function. This equation specifically deals with acid based neutralization. Units are also measured in kilojoules per mole. In general, the heat of neutralizations are usually between 55 to 57 kilojoules per mole. You will study the heat of neutralization in greater detail during mandatory experiment 22. To calculate the heat of reaction. Note, sometimes you will not be given the molecular formulas and it will be up to you to write them down. However, if this does occur, then the molecular formulas will not be new to you. Also, it is extremely important that the equation is balanced. This is not always the case, so double check. In this case, the equation is balanced. The sum of the heat's formation is the heat of reaction. Therefore, by getting the heat's formation values, we can figure out the heat of reaction. Step 1. You must write out the heat of formation equations of the compounds in the reaction. Ensure that they are balanced. Note, there is no heat formation for hydrogen gas. It is only compounds that have heat of formation values. Therefore, hydrogen gas or oxygen gas never have any heat of formation values. Step 2. See that octane has been broken down and not formed. Therefore, we must swap the equation. If we swap it, we represent it by means of an arrow, and we must also multiply its heat formation by a negative 1. Nothing needs to be done to the ethyl benzene as it is being formed. Note, if there were two moles of octane or ethyl benzene, then you would have to multiply this heat formation also. In this case though, there isn't. Step 3. Rewrite the equations and the new heat formation values. Now highlight the molecules being used in the main equation octane and ethyl benzene and hydrogen gas. There should be four moles of hydrogen gas on the right hand side of the arrow. Step 4. All other elements should cancel out. This can be done if they are both on opposite sides. If this step doesn't cancel everything out correctly, then you have made a mistake. Step 5. Add up the heat formation to get the heat of reaction. This question is very similar to solving the heats of reaction. However, a heat of combustion is specifically for fuels being burned in excess oxygen. This is generally the way the question is phrased. You are asked to write out a balanced equation and then calculate the heat of combustion. You are given the values for the heat of formation. Step 1. Write out the balanced equation. Simply write out the reactants and the products and ignore the number of moles for now. Note. You will always have a fuel and oxygen on the reactant side, and you will always get carbon dioxide and water as a product. Now we balance the equation. Start with the carbons first, then the hydrogens, and finish with oxygen. There is an oxygen molecule on its own, and this will be easiest to manipulate, so we often leave it to last. Note, by balancing we get 6.5 oxygen molecules. Guessing a fraction is perfectly fine, and you can carry on with the sum. 
If you don't want fractions, you could double it. However, you must double everything else as well. Step two, you must write out the heat formation equations for the compounds in the reaction. Ensure that they are balanced. Remember, it is only the compounds that have heat formation values. Therefore, oxygen gas doesn't have any heat formation value. Step three, see that butane has been broken down and not formed. Therefore, we must swap it. We represent this by means of an arrow and we must multiply its heat formation by a negative one. Remember, the heat formation values provided are in kilojoules per mole, so we must multiply their values if there is more than one mole. Carbon dioxide has four moles in the heat of combustion equation, so we must multiply its heat formation by four. There are also five moles of water, so we must multiply its heat formation by five. When writing the heat formation, be very careful you write the correct heat formation for the correct compound. It is very easy to make this mistake in an exam. Step 4. All other elements should cancel out. This can be done if they are both on opposite sides. If the step doesn't cancel everything out, then you have made a mistake. Step 5. Add the heat formation to get the heat of combustion. Do not forget those units. We are looking for the heat formation of ethanol. You will therefore be given other heat formation as well as the heat combustion. We follow the same steps as before. Step 1. Write out the balanced equation for the heat combustion of ethanol. Ethanol is the fuel and oxygen is the reactant. Carbon dioxide and water are therefore the products. Now balance the equation. Start with the carbons, then the hydrogens and then the oxygen. Step 2. Include the heat combustion value. You must write out the heat formation equations for the compounds. Ensure that they are balanced. Oxygen gas doesn't have a heat formation value. Step 3. See that ethanol has been broken down and not formed. Therefore, we must swap it and we represent this by an arrow and we must change its sign. As we do not know the value of delta H, therefore we must represent it as a negative X. Carbon dioxide has two moles in the heat combustion equation, so we must multiply its heat formation by two, and likewise we multiply water's heat formation by three. Step four, rewrite the equations and the new heat formation values. Now highlight the molecules being used in the main question. Ethanol, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide, and water. Be careful with oxygen. There should be three oxygen gas molecules on the reactant side. The half extra is cancelled out by the half oxygen molecule on the product side. Step four, everything else should cancel out. Step five, the sum of the heat formation should equal the heat of combustion. Add the known heat formation together and then subtract from the heat of combustion.